Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining me um, for the second uh, in our, series, our current series of property disputes uh, webinars. Um, today's uh, webinar uh, is on the new private residential tenancy, um, and in particular, looking at how disputes are resolved uh, in relation uh, to uh, such tenancies. Um, my name is Daniel Bain. I'm an associate in the Commercial Disputes and Regulation uh, team uh, at Sheffield Wedderburn, uh, with a particular focus on property disputes. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to be um, speaking today uh, about this, this topic. So, a couple of weeks ago, on the 1st of December, um, the Private Housing Tenancies Scotland Act 2016 uh, came into force. Uh, and the, the Act introduced a new statutory residential tenancy known as the Private Residential Tenancy. Um, all new residential tenancies which are created uh, on or after the 1st of December 2017 uh, are private residential tenancies and this, this replaces uh, the, the current assured tenancy, short assured tenancy. So it is no longer possible to create an assured tenancy or a short assured tenancy, although existing ones will continue uh, in force um, until they are um, terminated. Um, so we have this new type of tenancy uh, which is in force. Uh, I think it's safe to say that, uh, that, that the Act has introduced the most significant set of reforms uh, in the private rented sector for almost uh, 30 years. So it will be interesting to see uh, how things pan out. Today, as I say, we're going to be looking at, from, a, from, a, from a disputes perspective, we're going to be looking at how uh, well, the, the, the main areas where disputes can arise in relation to private residential tenancies uh, and, um, uh, and, and, and how they are resolved. So the two main areas uh, that we'll be looking at are uh, rent disputes and how they're resolved and also how landlords can go about recovering possession uh, of their property. One of the, the most significant changes um, that, that, that's been made in relation to private, res to private residential tenancies. It is now no longer possible for a landlord to seek to terminate uh, a residential tenancy simply because the agreed period of let has come to an end. There are a number of uh, grounds, one or more grounds, which must be established uh, in order for a landlord to bring a tenancy to an end. We'll come on to look at that. Um, we'll also look at the role of the first tier tribunal. Uh, which now has jurisdiction in relation to um, uh, private uh, residential housing. So let's look at that first of all. Um, the first tier tribunal uh, was actually created um, a few years ago by the Tribunals Scotland Act 2014. Um, that act created both the first tier tribunal and the, the upper tribunal, and it essentially uh, created a, a framework for the functions and jurisdictions of various existing tribunals and panels to be transferred uh, to the first tier tribunal um, and, uh, and to be dealt with in that way. So it was intended to kind of simplify and streamline the existing um, existing sort of structure uh, of, of tribunals uh, in Scotland. Um, at present, uh, well, look, the, the first year tribunal is divided up into chambers, and at present we have uh, the tax chamber, uh, which um, uh, took over the functions of the, the tax tribunals which existed prior to that, uh, and we have, uh, and, and most relevant for present purposes, the housing and property chamber, um, which um, began functioning actually last to December um, when it uh, took over certain functions in relation to private housing. Um, and, and now has had its jurisdiction uh, significantly expanded um, by having jurisdiction over private residential tenancies. It has a website, the uh, web address is on the slide uh, there. Um, now, essentially, its functions, um, as I say, it began functioning last December um, when it took over the functions of the private rented housing panel and the homeowner housing panel. Um, I won't go into detail about what those various panels do um, out of school with this webinar, but essentially, the private rented housing panel uh, dealt with um, applications um, relating to tenancies uh, under the Rent Scotland Act 1984 and the Housing Scotland Act 1988, and um, the homeowner housing panel was set up under the Property Factors Scotland Act 2011 to determine applications in relation to disputes between homeowners and their factor in relation to the, the, the factors statutory duties and compliance with the factors code of conduct. So from December last year, um, the, um, 
the first year of tribunal was dealing with, with those functions. Uh, and now, with the Act having come into the, the 2016 Act having come into force and the private residential tenancy having been uh, having been introduced, um, the the jurisdiction of the Sheriff Court uh, in relation to private residential uh, matters has now been transferred to the Housing and Property Chamber. Um, so, for example, it, it is no longer possible to um, to raise an action in the Sheriff Court um, for uh, for recovery of possession of a uh, private residential uh, property. Um, such an application must now be made to the, to the first year tribunal. Um, it will be interesting to see how, um, how that operates uh, going forward. Um, we don't know at the moment, for example, just how, how quickly um, the, the, the first year tribunal will be able to deal with such applications. But I, I mean, I would expect that because we now have a specialist tribunal looking at these matters, um, that, they, they will, that I would expect that they will be dealt with more quickly than perhaps uh, are currently dealt with in the various sheriff courts around Scotland. So what is the role of the first tier tribunal um, under the 2016 Act then? Well, essentially it has uh, powers in relation to three uh, areas. Um, it has powers in relation to the terms of the tenancy and provision of information by uh, the landlord to the tenant. It has uh, the power to determine rent in certain circumstances, and it has the power to issue eviction orders. Now, we'll look at um, rent disputes and, uh, and, and repossession in a little more detail. Um, for now, um, just uh, say a few words about um, the powers of the, the FTT in relation to the terms of the tenancy. Now, in terms of the Act, um, there are um, certain mandatory uh, terms. Um, the Scottish Government have made uh, regulations uh, which uh, specify uh, certain uh, mandatory terms which will apply to all uh, private, uh, private, uh, private residential tenancies. Um, and the, the Government have also published a, a model tenancy agreement which, which parties can use and which contains um, the mandatory terms. Now, in terms of the Act, the landlord uh, has a duty um, to provide uh, to the tenant the, the written terms of the tenancy and also a duty to provide certain specified uh, information. The information which has to be provided is specified in, again, regulations which have been made by uh, the Scottish Government. Um, and, and in particular, so where the written terms of the tenancy are in the form of the model the tenancy agreement which the government has published, then uh, the landlord must provide um, a copy of the EU notes uh, for the, the, the model tenancy agreement, or where the written terms of the tenancy are in, a, are in the form of a tenancy agreement which has been drafted by the landlord, which, as I mentioned, must contain the mandatory terms, then um, the, the landlord has to provide to the tenant the private residential tenancy statutory terms supporting notes. Those are available on the Scottish Government website. As I say, the landlord has a duty to um, provide to the tenant the written terms and to provide uh, the specified information. Now, if the landlord doesn't do that, then the tenant uh, can make an application to the first tier tribunal um, for, uh, for the tribunal to draw up the terms uh, of the tenancy. Um, and, uh, and if uh, the landlord has not provided the specified information, then uh, the, the tenant can apply to the tribunal um, for an order um, applying a sanction to the landlord. And essentially, um, if um, if the tribunal finds that the, the landlord has failed to comply uh, with their duty, um, then um, the, the, the tribunal can require to the landlord to pay um, uh, up to three months' rent uh, to the tenant in certain circumstances, or up to six months' rent, um, if, if both of those duties uh, have, have not been complied with. So those are important things to bear in mind uh, from a landlord's uh, perspective. Now, moving on to uh, rent disputes, um, which is one area where uh, one one of the I guess the two main areas where uh, disputes uh, can arise. Um, one thing to bear in mind is that um, well, what the Act introduces is a procedure uh, whereby um, the, the rent can be increased and, and puts in place certain restrictions in relation to rent increases. And one of those restrictions is that the rent. Um, cannot be increased more than once uh, in any 12-month period, and that's um, provided for in Section 19. In terms of the procedure, broadly speaking, uh, the landlord can increase the rent by um, 
serving a rent increase notice um, on the uh, on the tenant. That's uh, that's the, the procedure is set out in section 22. Um, there is a minimum notice period um, which must be specified in the notice, and it's it's, it's three months or such longer period as the parties uh, have agreed. Now, if the, um, the tenant doesn't agree with the rent uh, that has been set, then the tenant can um, make a referral to a local rent officer, uh, and the rent officer uh, then has the power to um, set the rent. And there are provisions in the Act uh, which deal with how, um, uh, how the various things that, that need to be taken into consideration when, uh, when determining uh, the rent. Um, and there are provisions about how um, how the rent officer is to go about uh, doing that. Uh, so, for example, there are provisions for the making of a provisional order, and uh, once the provisional order is made, then the landlord or the tenant can ask the rent officer to reconsider the proposed amount, uh, and then um, and then the final order is made. And uh, where um, where either party is is not satisfied with the final order uh, of the rent officer, then they can uh, make an appeal against the rent officer's decision to the first tier tribunal. Um, and the relevant provisions there are section 28 and 29. The first tier tribunal then has the power um, to set the rent, uh, and its decision is final, except for the correction of minor errors. Uh, one thing just to mention in relation to rent, I guess I don't propose to get into the details of this in this uh, webinar, um, but the Act uh, introduces what is known as a rent pressure zone. Uh, now, essentially, what the Act provides is that a local authority, where, where there are areas where there are excessive increases in rent, then the local authority um, can um, uh, seek to create a rent pressure zone. And, and if a rent pressure zone is created, then within that area, there are restrictions uh, on rent increases. And I say there are provisions in the Act uh, which deal with that. Now, moving on to... Um, Repossession. Um, I'd say some significant changes have been made uh, in relation to this uh, area. Um, there are, um, well, three ways in which a broadly three ways in which a, a private residential tenancy can be brought to an end. Uh, firstly, the tenant uh, can terminate the tenancy by giving notice uh, to the landlord, um, and that's provided for in section 40, 49. Um, there is a minimum notice period, and it's either um, the such period as may be agreed between the landlord and the tenant, or um, if there is no uh, agreement as to the as to the notice period, then it's uh, 28 days after the beginning of the period. There are provisions that I, I won't get into the details in this webinar, but there are provisions about how these notice periods are calculated. So you know, care care must be taken uh, to ensure that the provisions of the Act are complied with um, when issuing notices, and also in terms of uh, calculating um, the relevant notice periods. As regards uh, termination of a uh, tenancy by the landlord, um, then it can be terminated either uh, consensually uh, between the parties or by way of an eviction order. Now, consensual termination is provided for in Section 50 of the Act. Um, broadly speaking, the landlord uh, must give uh, a written notice to leave uh, to the tenant, uh, and then the tenancy terminates on the later of either the date is specified in the notice to leave or the date on which the tenant leaves. Now, there are provisions in the Act uh, around what uh, a, a notice to leave must uh, contain. So, um, again, here needs to be taken. The procedure is simpler, I think, than, than under the existing legislation, uh, and that was one of the aims behind the new Act. So, instead of the sort of range of notices uh, which existed under the older legislation, such as notices to quit, Section 33 notices, Section 19 notices, Etc. Uh, and the pre-tenancy notices, which had to be issued, um, there is now, uh, you know, it, it's much simpler. Um, the landlord issues a, a notice to leave in accordance with the 2016 Act. Um, so, whilst the procedure is simpler, um, again, care must be taken to ensure that the provisions of the Act are complied with. Um, otherwise, the notice will be invalidated. Um, in particular, Section 62 um, specifies uh, certain requirements in relation to the notice. Two in particular, I would mention that the, the date specified in the notice must be the date on which the landlord expects to become entitled to apply for an eviction order, um, and there are separate provisions in the Act uh, that deal with that. Um, and the notice must specify the ground or grounds on which uh, an eviction order will be sought if the tenant doesn't 
we uh, the property. Uh, but as I say, if the tenant uh, does then leave, uh, then the, the tenancy will come to an end. So what happens if the tenant uh, doesn't leave? Well, that's, uh, the, the, the landlord can then uh, make an application to the first tier, tier, tier tribunal uh, for an eviction order. And the relevant provisions uh, in relation to that are sections 51 um, to 56. Now, uh, in order to make such an application, the landlord must already have given a, a, no, a valid uh, notice to leave. Um, so that, that's important uh, to bear in mind. Um, when it's only then if the, um, the tenant doesn't leave um, in accordance with that notice uh, that an application can be made. The, the first year tribunal has the power to issue an eviction order if it finds that one or more of the eviction grounds specified in the Act uh, applies and will come on to look at uh, what those grounds are. Um, one thing to bear in mind is that there are, there are certain restrictions on making an application to the first year tribunal for an eviction order. Um, one is in terms of timing um, that there is a restriction on applying to the FTT during the uh, notice period um, and the notice period is uh, 28 days uh, beginning on the day the tenant receives the notice to leave from the landlord it's uh, 28 days uh, if um, uh, the, the tenancy is within its first six months or if certain specified eviction grounds apply um, or um, the notice period is 84 days um, if, um, if the parties are beyond uh, the first six months of the tenancy. If the parties are within the first six months of the tenancy, then, uh, as I say, um, it, it's, it's 28 days um, that must apply, um, uh, 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 or if certain specified evictions, so if, if 28 days, or, or if certain. 28 days if certain specified eviction grounds apply, um, those grounds are that the tenant is not occupying the let property of their home, the tenant has failed to comply with an obligation under the, the, the tenancy, the tenant has been in rent arrears for three or more consecutive months, um, the, the tenant has a relevant conviction as defined, we'll come on to look at what that means, uh, the tenant has engaged in relevant antisocial behaviour, again we'll come on to look at what that means, or that the tenant associates in the property with a person who has a relevant conviction or who has engaged in relevant antisocial behaviour. Um, these uh, grounds are specified uh, in terms of the grounds that can be used here, uh, that's the, the relevant provisions section 54, uh, subsection 3. Uh, one thing just to bear in mind, uh, I, think, I guess for, for landlords and uh, tenants, is that um, if after an eviction order has been obtained, um, uh, the, the, um, the tenant feels that it has been uh, improperly obtained or that the, the landlord has perhaps misled the tribunal uh, into granting an order, um, the tenant can make an application for a, a type of order which is called a wrongful uh, termination order and it essentially uh, enables the tribunal to impose a penalty on a landlord when it later transpires that, um, that the landlord ought not to have been granted a, an eviction order. Um, so, uh, it, Broadly speaking, in making wrongful termination order, the tribunal can order that penalty of up to six months' rent is paid, um, and, uh, and, and such an order um, has to be notified to the local authority, uh, and that can have an impact on uh, the landlord's registration status when it comes to um, granting tenancies. So, just I guess a word of warning there in terms of um, uh, seeking uh, eviction orders. So, what are um, the various grounds, um, well, they are set out um, in Schedule 3 uh, to, the, to the 2016 Act, and they are split into um, probably four categories. Um, the first category is that the, 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 the property is required for uh, some other purpose. The second category uh, relates to the status of the tenant. Uh, the third uh, relates to the conduct of the tenant uh, in, in the let property, uh, and the fourth is where there is some sort of legal impediment to the let uh, continuing. Um, looking at the first category, they're set out uh, on the slide there. Now, I should mention that the various grounds are, are split into either they are either a mandatory ground or a discretionary ground. Um, most of them are mandatory, um, and uh, where um, uh, uh, if in an application to the, to the FTT a mandatory ground is established, then the tribunal must grant an eviction order. 
consider whether it's reasonable in the circumstances of the grant act. But if, if the ground on which the landlord is, is, um, uh, is, is, is founding is a discretionary ground, then the tribunal can only grant an eviction order where it considers that it's reasonable in the circumstances to do so. The onus is on the landlord uh, to um, persuade the tribunal uh, that it's reasonable. So in these slides, the mandatory grounds are signified by an M and the discretionary grounds are signified by a D. Now, in terms of this first category, uh, most of them, in fact all but one, are uh, mandatory. Um, some of them uh, can largely speak for themselves uh, in terms of situations where the landlord will tend to sell a property or the property is going to be sold by a lender uh, or intending to refurbish. There are some, some detail around how these provisions apply. And, uh, time doesn't permit me to get into all of that detail uh, just now, um, but uh, it's all set out in Schedule 3 uh, to the Act. Um, the one which is discretionary is where uh, a landlord's family member intends to live with the property and uh, there um, the, the tribunal has to be satisfied that it's reasonable in all of the circumstances uh, to make uh, uh, an eviction order. Moving on to the next category, these as I say relate to the tenant's uh, status. Um, so uh, there are two grounds here. The first is where um, it was a, if, if the property was let in order to provide an employee with a home and the tenant is no longer an employee. Um, then um, a, a, an eviction order can be granted. There's a, there's a mandatory element to that and a discretionary element. It depends on when uh, the application is made. So if the application is made uh, within uh, 12 months um, of, uh, within 12 months of the tenant no longer uh, being an employee or, or if a tenant never became an employee, then within 12 months of the tenancy starting, then the, the tribunal must uh, grant an eviction order. Um, but if the application uh, is made um, out beyond that, uh, either of those 12 month periods, um, then it's discretionary uh, and the tribunal um, must uh, determine whether or not it's reasonable in the circumstances to grant the order. The other one there is uh, where the property is left account of the tenant having assessed need for community care. Uh, and uh, as I said, the and that one is um, discretionary. In terms of the tenant's uh, conduct, there are a number of uh, grounds, uh, a mix of mandatory and discretionary grounds. Um, uh, so, I mean, very often um, it will be where there is a, a breach of the tenancy obligation. There are two grounds relating to that. First is um, a breach of a non monetary obligation. Non-payment of rent is concerned. There is a mandatory element and a discretionary element. Um, uh, so, um, where the the, um, the 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 tenancy can be terminated, where the tenant has been in arrears for three or more months, and uh, where the total arrears are equal to or more than one month's rent, um, but the, uh, the tribunal will um, take into account uh, whether. Uh, the failure to pay rent is as a result of um, a, a delay or a failure in the payment of a relevant benefit. So that will come into play. So essentially, if the tenant still owes at least a month's rent by the time of the tribunal hearing, then the ground is mandatory and the tribunal must issue an eviction order. Um, uh, and uh, as I say, the tribunal also has to be satisfied that, uh, that it's not as a result of a, a delay or, or non-receipt of a relevant benefit by the tenant. If the tenant owes less than a month's rent or, or is no longer in arrears by the time the tribunal hearing comes around, then the ground is discretionary and the tribunal will decide whether it's reasonable to issue an eviction order, um, again, taking into account whether um, it has resulted from um, the non-payment of relevant benefit. Um, as far as um, uh, relevant criminal convictions and relevant antisocial behaviour are concerned, um, the as far as criminal convictions are concerned, that ground applies if the tenant is convicted of an offence uh, punishable by imprisonment that involved them either using the property for illegal reasons, or letting someone use the property for illegal reasons, or committing a crime within or near the property. Um, the landlord has to apply to the tribunal within a year of the tenant getting the conviction, uh, unless there is a reasonable excuse for not doing that. And as far as antisocial behaviour is concerned, um, that ground applies if the tenant has behaved in an antisocial way to another person by doing something which either causes them alarm or distress, is a nuisance or annoyance, or is considered to be harassment. 
um, the tribunal will consider the behaviour, who involved and where it occurred, and uh, decide whether to issue an eviction order. And again, the landlord has to make the application within a year of the, the, the behaviour uh, taking place, unless they have a, a reasonable excuse for not doing that. Um, and then finally, there's ground about the tenant associating with someone who, who has a relevant conviction or who has engaged in relevant antisocial behaviour. Um, now, that person could be a subtenant, uh, a lodger, or, or just somebody that the tenant lets into the property on more than one occasion. Um, again, the landlord must apply within a year uh, of the conviction or behaviour taking place uh, unless they have a reasonable excuse. The final category uh, of, of ground on which a uh, landlord can seek an eviction order is where there's a legal impediment tenants continuing. Um, there are three grounds here. The first is where the landlord has ceased to be registered with the local authority. Um, now, this, this could be because the local council has either refused to enter them in the register in the first place or, or has either removed them from the register. Um, the second ground is where, um, if it's a, a house of multiple occupancy, it's where the landlord's um, HMO licence has been removed so that keeping all the tenants in the property is no longer legal. Um, and the third ground is where uh, an overcrowding statutory notice has been served on the landlord. Um, so uh, those are uh, those are all um, discretionary grounds. Now, uh, as regards removal, um, the, the, once an eviction order has been obtained, um, the, the, I mean the procedure is uh, essentially the same as it was uh, in terms of obtaining an order for recovery of possession from the sheriff court. A um, uh, charge for removing must be served in the first instance, and that must be served by a sheriff, sheriff officer giving the tenant with 14 days to remove, although that period can be paid by the court. Um, if the tenant doesn't remove, then the sheriff officer uh, can then enforce removal, and the sheriff officer must give at least 48 hours notice of the date on which the removal will be enforced. So that is a fairly quick uh, canter through, um, as I say, the, the main areas where disputes can arise and how disputes will be resolved um, in, in relation to the new private residential tenancy regime. Now, if anybody has any questions, um, feel free, we do have a couple of minutes, uh, uh, feel free to stick them into the chat box or indeed contact me uh, afterwards if you do have any questions. Um, my contact details are on the slide there. Um, one question has come through. Um, could there still be statutory statutory assured tenancies in the system? Sorry, I, I think I think perhaps we short assured tenancies, FATs, I'm assuming that what's meant there's a short assured tenancy in five years' time. Um, the scenario I have in mind is where a tenant does not take any proactive steps to convert the tenancy into the new type under the Act. There seems to be no limitation at all whether the current short assured tenancy is going to be a limitation of statutory limitation. So the new type of tenancy is never created for the present tenant um, well, it's a good question. Um, I, I, there, I mean, there may be complications there, um, I suppose, um, and, uh, and I've not thought through the intricacies of that, I uh, have to say. I mean, as I said at the beginning, um, an existing uh, assured tenancy or short assured tenancy will uh, continue in existence until it is validly terminated. So if a short assured tenancy can roll on in that way, or then yes, I guess theoretically it could still be in existence. Um, but I guess there may be some intricacy there. I guess that's one that would that I would need to think through. Um, I now um, and and if I, I appreciate that, I may not have answered your, your question because I think, as I say, there are some intricacies that would need to be thought through. So. Um, feel free uh, to, to get in touch. Um, I'd be happy to discuss that one further and give that one some, some further thought. Um, but, uh, but yeah, as I say, the basic position is um, it's, uh, it's any new tenancy which is created now after the 1st of December will be a private residential tenancy and will be subject to the 2016 Act. But if, if an existing tenancy has not yet been validly terminated, then that will continue until it is validly terminated, um, however long that might take. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I can see that the question raises some uh, some interesting questions there about the circumstances in, in which that can happen. Um, I'd be happy to chat that through. If anybody has any further questions, no more have come through, but um, as I say, feel free to uh, get in touch um, if you do have any questions. Um, all that remains to be said is that, um, well, thank you for joining me today. Um, this is the second in a series of three webinars. 
Um, our next one is in January in details uh, about that webinar um, will be sent to you um, along with um, a, a link to um, the slides and recording for this webinar. So um, thanks very much uh, for joining me. Um, hope it's been of interest and, and hope to um, I hope you're able to uh, join me at our next webinar in January. Thanks a lot.